Hey everybody, you are watching Flick Connection, the show that helps you get more out of movies, and today we're going to be talking about 19 near-perfect movies you can currently catch on Prime Video. So believe it or not, Prime Video actually has a lot of good movies, but their user interface is awful. It makes it really hard to find good movies to watch. Now normally on this channel, you will find me recommending movies that you likely have not seen, and while this list may have a few of those, this list will also feature quite a few familiar favorites that you probably didn't know were hiding out on Prime Video right now. And this list is gonna span a wide range of genres, so it's sure to have something for everyone, but we're gonna start this list all the way at the back with a very underrated horror movie called Frailty. Now Frailty stars and was directed by Bill Paxton. And in this movie he plays the single father of two boys and he begins to believe that he's being spoken to by God and he's being told to kill demons. Now that may sound all well and good, but to his oldest son, it appears that his father has lost his mind and is just killing random people that he believes are demons. It is dark creepy stuff and what is so interesting about it is the perspective you're seeing most things from the viewpoint of the oldest son who is just old enough to start questioning his father's authority whereas there is a younger boy who questions none of it it's wild dark stuff bill paxton did a great job helming this thing he did not direct many movies but he did a killer job with this and he's great in it it does have some great elements it's got a little bit of a cult following if you've never seen it i highly recommend it and then finally what makes it near perfect for a movie that has a wildly different take it is surprisingly cohesive and glued together it works surprisingly well for something so different and genre wise we're going to take a big leap here and go with a somewhat light-hearted documentary from the 60s called the endless summer in the 50s and 60s, Bruce Brown directed quite a few surfing documentaries, but The Endless Summer is not only the best, it is easily the most famous and quite possibly to this day still the most famous documentary or movie about surfing. And it's not just information about surfing, it is a really good story. It takes a couple of surfers that end up going around the world trying to find the perfect wave, and they're literally chasing summer as the seasons change around the world, which is where the title comes from. But you get this amazing sort of view of all these different surfing communities around the world. And what makes this movie near perfect is that for a documentary, that was made over 60 years ago, it holds up surprisingly well, and you need to have zero, and I mean zero, interest in surfing to find this really interesting, and, and at the very least, just beautiful to look at. Now, unlike a lot of streaming services, Currently, Prime Video has a lot of westerns. They've got a lot of old Clint Eastwood ones, just good stuff. But I chose Open Range to go on this list. This stars Robert Duvall and Kevin Costner and was actually directed by Kevin Costner. It is quite long at almost two and a half hours and it does have a very slow pace. So be in the mood for that, but the story is great, the performances are fantastic, and you end up with a really great climax to this movie. And you don't have to wait the entire movie to get to that. Like I said, the story is quite good. It just feels kind of long and stretched down and not necessarily in a bad way. You just don't want to put this on one night when you only have about 90 minutes to watch a movie. And what makes this one near perfect is it's easily one of the best Westerns to have been released in the 21st century so far. Now, one the whole family can and will enjoy, and that is a hidden gem, is minuscule Valley of the Lost Ants. Now, this movie is from France, but it's not French language because there's literally no dialogue in this movie. But what you get is an incredible adventure with a lost ladybug and a bunch of ants fighting over a tin of sugar cubes left behind at a picnic. What is so interesting about this movie is you get these great little insect characters that are fairly well designed and fun to watch. And they are computer generated obviously, but they're not in computer generated environments. They're in real filmed environments. So the world looks amazing. It looks real because it is. And it's not just cool to see them in this setting. It is a really good story. Not just good, it is very epic. And the reason this one's near perfect is because it is going to entertain you 
and your kids thoroughly, despite the fact that there is not a single word spoken throughout its entire 90 minute runtime. Now, one that was a total sleeper and a major crowd pleaser back when it came out is Moneyball, starring Brad Pitt, Jonah Hill, Philip Seymour Hoffman in one of his better supporting roles he did right before he died. He's fantastic in this movie, and so is the rest of the supporting cast. This is a surprisingly effective movie, not just because it's good and interesting, but because so many people seem to like this movie so much. If you have not seen it, it is the true story of the manager of the Oakland A's who took a new approach approach to managing a baseball team that was much more analytic based than just sort of feeling based, which is how baseball teams were managed for so long. Nowadays, they're all managed this way, and this movie kind of shows how that comes about. And what makes Moneyball near perfect is that just like The Endless Summer, Moneyball ask very little of the audience in terms of prior knowledge. You don't need to know much, if anything, about baseball. You don't even really have to be interested in baseball whatsoever to thoroughly enjoy Moneyball. And I also decided to include Romeo and Juliet, the 90s version with DiCaprio and Claire Danes. I find this one to be just incredibly rewatchable. This is from director Baz Luhrmann. It's easily my favorite movie of his for multiple reasons, but the big one is the style of this movie. Now, I know he puts that style in a lot of his movies, but there's something about the world that this movie takes place in that I absolutely love, and it's mostly the look of it. It's got this great grungy 90s vibe to it, yet it's just different enough that it clearly doesn't quite take place in our world, which is what makes the original Shakespearean dialogue works so well. I mean, we have movies where Romeo and Juliet takes place within the time period it was written, so it's very interesting to see an updated version, and this isn't the only one, but it's easily the best one. And what makes this one near perfect is that for a movie that is a quarter century old already, that's based on a play that is four centuries old, it is surprisingly relevant and entertaining. The Social Network is also included on Prime right now. This is the story of the creation of Facebook. Something that I think seemed a little more interesting back when this movie came out, Facebook has morphed and turned to a thing that I'm certainly not interested in anymore, which is why I'm not on there. But at the time that this was released, Facebook was everywhere. All college kids were using it, but it had transformed from something only for people in college to something for everybody, and Zuckerberg was still in his mid-20s. It was just a very interesting time for this movie to come out. Now, the movie itself goes in somewhat of a Citizen Kane direction, which I like. I think it works for the movie. I do question how much of what we see here is accurate. Now, story-wise and what actually unfolds, I think is all completely accurate, but the character interactions and everything like that, obviously a lot of that is embellished for the story, but it works here. It works in service of the story. It makes things more interesting. It makes this rewatchable. And what makes this one near perfect is that while it's far from my favorite David Fincher movie, this is him where he really started to hit his stride as a director in terms of making something that is composed, again, near perfectly. Steven Soderbergh has directed so many good movies, movies like Ocean's Eleven, Aaron Brockovich, Out of Sight, Contagion, which is one I know a lot of people have watched in the last year or year and a half, but his best movie, I think, is easily still Traffic. The worst part about you, Monty. Monty? <laughs> the worst part about you, Monty, is you realize the futility of what you're doing and you do it anyway. Wish you could see how transparent you are. Released in 2000, this movie is still one of the best drug movies ever made. I would put this one maybe in top 10. And it's got an incredible ensemble cast with Michael Douglas, Catherine Zeta-Jones, Benicio Del Toro, Luis Guzman, Don Cheadle. And there is so much packed into traffic. There's so much happening, yet it all manages to work. And when I say so much happening, I believe there's like five different stories at play in any given time. Soderbergh makes that work by having having sort of different color palettes, 
in the lighting per story. Some are blue, some are yellow. You always kind of know where you are. Then when characters cross paths, it still manages to make sense. That method of storytelling in movies I find to be often very clunky and not hard to follow, but kind of a pain in the ass to follow. And traffic is fairly seamless in that regard. There's some heavy moments, some action-packed moments, some really tense moments, and then just an interesting look inside the world of the drug trade. Just a primo top shelf pick. If you've never seen it, I highly recommend it. And if it's been a while, there's a very good chance you forgot how good this movie actually is. Now we're only in the middle of this list, but my next pick has topped multiple lists over the years. It's one of my favorite hidden gems to recommend. So much so, I don't even know that it's a hidden gem anymore. I've recommended it so often, but it has been a while since I've talked about mud. In this movie, Matthew McConaughey plays a man that goes by the name Mud. He lives on a little island in the middle of the Mississippi River in Arkansas, and a couple of young boys discover him and sort of get wrapped up into a plot he's tied up in. Now, this movie is beautifully shot, really great character for Matthew McConaughey, and the boys do a great job acting as well. You got a great but small role from Michael Shannon, and just a really good, solid story delivered really well. If you find that you typically like my recommendations, do not pass up mud. Now, if you're having trouble finding all the movies that I'm talking about on this list, one of two things has happened. Either this is an older video and you didn't realize and some of these movies are gone, or you're in a country where all of these movies are not available because of licensing, but you can still access everything I'm talking about and way more with today's sponsor, CyberGhost V. VPN. If you watch YouTube with any sort of regularity, you're hit with VPN ads all the time, and they all basically do the same thing. They keep your web browsing safe, secure, and private. But CyberGhost has specialized servers targeted at select streaming services like Netflix, Prime Video, Hulu, Disney+, HBO Max, that allow you to watch those services in different countries. In the UK, Canada, Germany, United States, Australia, and more. And what's interesting is because of the way licensing works, all those countries have vastly different libraries on Netflix, on Prime. So potentially, you're able to unlock way more content than you have access to now. CyberGhost is super easy to use, and they have a 45-day money-back guarantee, so there's virtually no risk. And they're there with 24-7 customer support, so they're always easy to get a hold of, because maybe you'll need help getting it set up on some of your devices. Speaking of devices, though, you can use it on up to seven at the same time, and it's all the different types of devices you already stream movies and shows on. So go to the link in the description, pay as little as $2.19 a month. $2.19 a month, less than half the cost of one new release movie rental, to unlock way more movies and shows than you could ever possibly hope to watch. It's a fantastic deal. I highly recommend CyberGhost, but let's go ahead and move on with my top 10 picks on this list. I'm trying to clear up my ears. Nah, you create a pressure inside your head, it opens up the eustachian tube. Nah. 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 All right, my next pick is another classic from the 60s that still holds up today. The Odd Couple stars Walter Matthau and Jack Lemmon in easily their best roles, best movie, because their performances and their chemistry is unlike anything else. It's very rare to get two characters. It does happen, but it's very rare to get two characters, especially comedy actors, to work together this well. When it happens, it's magic, and you get movies that last for decades on end and spawn TV shows and sequels. That's what you get with The Odd Couple. I'm sure most of you are familiar, but for those of you that are not, it's just about two guys that live together in an apartment in Manhattan in the 60s, and they are wildly different from each other. Walter Matthau's character is kind of a slob, and Jack Lemmon's character is not only clean, he's incredibly uptight, but there's nothing too topical or too of that era, other than the technicolor, the fashion, and decor. Other than that, it's extremely relatable even today. And I consider this one near perfect because there are not 
many movies over 50 years old that are still this relevant and this funny today. Leaving Las Vegas makes this list as easily the most depressing movie on the list and honestly one of the most depressing movies I've ever seen. But this is the movie and the performance that won Nicolas Cage an Academy Award and deservedly so. Not only does he do a really good job depicting an alcoholic, he does a good job doing it a little over the top, doing it a little bit Nicolas Cage. Not too much, but there's a lot of pizzazz to his performance, which is what makes it so entertaining. Here, you get true Nicolas Cage, but somewhat restrained. He's just really well directed in this movie. Elizabeth Shue easily gives her best performance of her entire career in this movie, and I'm a fan of hers. In this movie, he plays a struggling alcoholic. I shouldn't even say struggling. He has gone to Las Vegas with the intention of drinking himself to death. I told you, it's the most depressing movie I've ever seen. And he falls in love with a prostitute played by Elizabeth Shue. I consider this one to be near perfect because everything's in sync. Nicolas Cage is bringing the heat. The director is doing an incredible job. It's easily his best movie. It's got a great soundtrack. You can kind of feel everything you're supposed to feel. It just, they nailed what they were trying to do, which is rare with movies. But Leaving Las Vegas is a great example of a really kind of sad, depressing movie that's also really effective. And with that, we're gonna jump from Las Vegas to Reno with Hard Eight. Now this is actually the first feature film from famed director Paul Thomas Anderson. After this he would go on to do Boogie Nights and then that launched his career, but Hard Eight is still kind of slept on because it was not really well known back when it was released. In this movie, Philip Baker Hall plays a grifter, someone that basically lives off of the casinos and he takes a drifter, for lack of a better word, played by John C. Riley, a fairly young John C. Riley, takes him under his wing and teaches him his ways of sort of living off of the system. It's really interesting stuff. The first 10 minutes or so of this movie will keep you captivated. It is fantastic stuff, but then you also get this really rich story that develops. Samuel L. Jackson has a really great role here. Gwyneth Paltrow, before she was really famous, she plays a prostitute here as well in this very tragic sort of character. And it ultimately is somewhat of a tragic story, but also just really well done. It's all fairly subtle, but still incredibly interesting. Great cinematography. If you have been a fan of Paul Thomas Anderson movies in any kind of way and have never watched Hard Eight, make it the first one you watch off of this list. The reason it is so perfect is again, Everything works together here. Philip Baker Hall, it's easily his greatest performance. This is sort of his masterpiece of a character, in my opinion. And then you get really amazing performances from some other people, like Philip Seymour Hoffman shows up for just a few minutes and steals the show for a few minutes. It's great stuff. I cannot recommend this enough for movie buffs. There are a lot of movies that depict high school really well, and a lot of really funny ones. But the one that I think maybe nails it the best is Fast Times at Ridgemont High. Hi, Brad. You know how cute I always thought you were. Not only does Fast Times have some iconic scenes, more than one, it's incredibly quotable. The characters are still relatable. This came out in the 80s, which to some of us seems like it was recent, but I mean, Fast Times came out in 1982, and for those of you keeping score at home, that's just a few months shy of 40 years ago. So it has been quite a while, and still manages to be really relevant and relatable, at least to my generation. I graduated high school in 2003. I don't know how relatable this is to people currently in high school. I imagine it's a little more removed, than it was for me, but still, so many great scenes, especially considering there's not much of a story here. It kind of meanders similarly to Dazed and Confused, yet it all works together so well. Great soundtrack, great characters, great performances, and the fact that this one has held up so well over so long and hasn't really been dethroned as one of the best high school movies ever made, that's what makes it near perfect. Now, I've got a Stanley Kubrick movie on this list, but odds are it's one a lot of you haven't seen. It's one of his first feature films. It is a heist movie called The Killing. It's from 1956, and it actually stars Sterling Hayden, who most of you probably recognize from this scene in The Godfather. <laughs> Oh, 
Now because it's from 1956, it does have a slower pace than movies made today. However, everything that is set up in the first half of the movie, which can be slow, comes back around in this really brilliant way that I think only Stanley Kubrick could have done in 1956. Like I said, this is a heist movie. It's about a robbery of a horse race track. So you do get a typical heist setup and execution. All of that stuff is really interesting, but there's also this incredible balance that happens with the movie where the heist is sort of the fulcrum and you get everything before it and then after that I'm gonna give things away I'm just trying to tell you, this movie is much smarter than movies made in 1956 were in terms of just how clever the plot twists and things were. If you've never seen it, it's all done in black and white. You're gonna forget about that five minutes into this movie. If you consider yourself a fan of Stanley Kubrick movies and have never seen this one, it's free, it's included with Prime Video right now. Go watch it. My next pick is my favorite Guy Ritchie movie. At times, I try to like other ones, but I always come back to Snatch. Gotta be a better way to say that. But I find it to be easily his most entertaining movie, and not just because Brad Pitt has a funny accent in it. I think all the characters are amazing in it. Bricktop is one of the best gangster characters, I think, of all time. He's in the top 10 best gangster characters of all time. I'm saying it here. It's a done deal. But Jason Statham is really fantastic in it. It's one of my favorite characters he's ever played and I'm a big fan of his. At its core, it's a really good gangster movie, but then you get this crazy caper with this diamond kind of on the side that gets intertwined. And just again, everybody's fantastic. Cause you've also got Vinnie Jones, Benicio Del Toro, Dennis Farina, Jason Fleming, and Lenny James. Just all around great stuff. There's a reason this one has held up so long and a reason Guy Ritchie is still making gangster movies today. My next pick is probably the second darkest movie on this list behind Frailty, but it's also one of the funniest. I'm talking about Martin McDonough's In Bruges. I mean, it's all windy stairs. I'm not being funny. What exactly are you trying to say? What exactly am I trying to say? These are a bunch of fucking elephants. Now, I'm a big fan of his movies. I love, love Seven Psychopaths and really, really liked Three of Billboards Outside Ebbing, Missouri. And honestly, did not really enjoy In Bruges the first time I saw it. Not as much as I had hoped to. But over the years, this is a movie that has grown on me. Not because my tastes have changed much necessarily, but because there's so many subtle jokes in this movie that are just shrouded in misery because of Colin Farrell's just miserable character that it's easy to miss them on the first pass. But after multiple viewings, this movie is so rich with so many little subtle jokes, cringe humor, situational humor, crude humor, and it all works. Because this one can be so miserable, if you're not tapped into it properly, it could make for a miserable watch, but if you do tap into it early on, you're gonna laugh all the way through it as much as I do when I rewatch it. And I have just rewatched this one in the last week or so. Now my top three on this list are not just crowd pleasers. They're some of the most popular movies ever made. And I don't talk about them much on the channel because I'm usually giving you hidden gems, lesser known movies, but with the theme of this video, I figure it's a great time to talk about these movies, starting with my number three pick, The Usual Suspects. Not only do I love this movie, and I love it. I love all the characters. I love the way the story unfolds. I love the twist, even though it's kind of this iconic twist that everybody knows now, it's still so interesting and clever. It's fun to watch it be delivered towards the end of the movie still, but that's not the reason to watch it. The characters along the way are so fun to watch. This is a movie that is not only great to watch in its original form with all the profanity and violence, this movie is actually really fun to watch when it's edited. When they put this one on TV, for an example, instead of saying they say fairy godmother, and it is brilliant. I absolutely love that. So this one is just a gem that has maintained an audience for so many years because it's unusually entertaining and well put together. If you've never seen it, obviously this is a top tier Darren Van Dam pick, but I can promise you, if it has been a while, and I would wager to bet it's been a long time since most of you watched The Usual Suspects. It is well worth revisiting. And my number two pick is one of the most famous crowd pleasers of all time. And whereas normally that's kind of a negative thing to say, 
Rudy deserves that title because it is so widely loved. Just like the other sports movies on this list, you need to have zero interest in football to enjoy this movie, zero interest in Notre Dame to enjoy this movie. This is quite possibly the best underdog movie ever made. And it's a true story and somewhat faithfully told as well. And what makes Rudy near perfect is that it's not just a good football movie. There's so many other elements and they did such a great job of encapsulating all the important parts of his life that sort of drove him and led him to pursue this goal. I absolutely love it and there's a reason it I absolutely love it and it's directed in a way that's just pitch perfect. It just has got this uplifting thing that happens so often throughout it. If you've never seen it, it's it's a must watch, not just for movie buffs, but for anybody. But again, if it's been a while, it's gonna be hard for you to find something on Prime Video right now that is more uplifting than Rudy. And then we're gonna wrap up this list with my number one pick, which is one of my favorite movies of all time. Easily, easily my top 25, probably higher. And I know some of you are gonna think it's a little bit of a cop out, but just hang with me, let me explain why Predator makes my number one pick. So obviously this movie has held up, it's well liked and respected by most people, but I can kind of see where some folks are still thinking like, oh, that's just a brash over the top action movie. It is, it is that, but it does that perfectly, better than most. Proof that Predator does it better than most is that they continue to try to replicate it with mild success, but it's usually a failure. If it were easy to pull this off, don't you think they would do it more often, specifically with Predator movies? Like they've yet to replicate this level of success and not just box office success. So for some more context, Predator was released in 1987 and is really the first big budget movie from director John McTiernan. He did do one with Pierce Brosnan, called Nomads before this, but that movie has been completely forgotten with time. But this really broke him out as an action movie director. And in my opinion, he is the greatest action movie director of all time. And somehow the name John McTiernan is not a household name, but just for example, his movies include Predator, Die Hard, The Hunt for Red October, The 13th Warrior, Die Hard with a Vengeance, and honestly, The Last Action Hero is a brilliant action movie spoof. It's probably the best ever made. So this guy has got it going on when it comes to action. Not only that, he has sort of invented, not the genre, but he's invented the way the genre looks with movies like Predator and Die Hard. They've got looks to them that have been replicated. They've got pacing that is still replicated today. And again, rarely done as well as he did it in the 80s, long before anybody else was really making movies like this. Think about it. Predator, 1987. Yeah, there were action movies before, but none like this. You can go back and rewatch Predator. By the way, all the Predator movies, or most of them, are included with Prime Video right now. But you can go back and watch the original Predator from 1987 with Arnold Schwarzenegger. It has been remastered. It looks amazing. The jungle just pops out. If you've got a big screen, it looks like it was filmed yesterday in most shots. And I haven't even started talking about how great the characters are. They're not the most fleshed out characters in movie history, far from it, but they're very concise little caricatures of these commandos, and they're all different enough and you get some really fantastic performances. I know a lot of people just think of this as an Arnold Schwarzenegger movie, but you've also got Carl Weathers. Kevin Peter Hall is the Predator. He was also Harry and Harry and the Hendersons. He does a really great job. The movie features two United States governors, including Jesse Ventura, and Bill Duke, I think probably gives the performance of his lifetime in this movie. He's still in stuff today, but Predator is kind of the crown jewel, I think, of his movie career, and for good reason. He really did do a great job in this movie. He had cutting edge special effects, nominated for multiple Academy Awards, and above all else, all the stuff I've just described is really, truly glued together incredibly well in Predator, and I'm not trying to sell this as some sort of masterpiece or anything, but it's incredibly tight. Again, it's concise, it works really well, there's not a lot of fat on this movie, and it 
played a major part. I don't want to say this was the movie, but it played a major part in shaping what action movies would become as we went into the 90s and the 21st century. And Predator manages to just hold up incredibly well, and it does all the things that I love about movies. You've got incredible visual effects, you've got a good creature design from Stan Winston, and it's got a great pace to it. The pace is fast, but you also don't really see the Predator for quite a while. And I wish more movies in this genre. Over the top, sci-fi action movies. I wish more of them got this close to nailing it. It's pretty rare, which is why I love Predator so much. If it's been a while since you've seen it, I'm telling you, the restored version that is on Prime Video right now is gonna look amazing on your TV or your projector, particularly TVs nowadays. The frame rate keeps up. Man, at Jungle, I'm telling you, it looks amazing. So that's the list. Let me know in the comments below what you've watched recently. Might pick up a couple of recommendations that you will see here on future videos. Also, help me thank the Patreon supporters. If you're interested in becoming a Patreon supporter, there's a link in the video description. There's also a link where you can become a channel member and and get access to exclusive movie reviews and recommendations right here on YouTube. But I will keep making these videos as long as you keep watching them. Thanks for checking out this episode, and you will see me on the next one.